The one very difficult question, highly theological debatable, was why did the priests do both the killing and the offering of the birds? Carl, you remember your question? Do you have an answer, brother? Do you have an answer yet? Okay. So this was, this was on the back of us talking about how the offerer would bring the offerings for, for, for whatever they bring it for, either for as a worship offering or as a sin offering, a guilt offering. And the person who was, who was bringing the offering did the killing and the cutting. And the high priest or the priest only uh, took the blood and, and, and sprinkled the blood over the altar and over the various parts of the tabernacle as required by specific offerings. But when it came to the bird, the priest took the bird and the priest killed the bird, and the priest offered the bird. And the question was, why is there a significant theological uh, reason for this? And the answer is no. It's simply an efficient one. Because the bird has got, it's got so little material to work with that by the time a person has cut it and, and broken it up and given it to the priest, there's almost no blood left. So that to try and make sure that the priest ended up with a sacrifice of which the blood could be used and sprinkle on the altar, the priest would take the bird, and the priest would kill the bird, and it's unclear whether the priest broke the, uh, rang the bird's neck, or cut his throat with his nail. And there's a huge debate about that. So nonetheless, the priest kills the bird, and the priest offers the bird, and sprinkles the blood on the altar, purely because it was the most efficient and effective way of doing it. There was nothing theologically significant about it, it wasn't there? This was some special offering, which was different to the others. So... Is that okay, brother? Are you going to bank it and take it home with you? You like that? Cool. All right. Hey, I'm okay with that. Next question came from uh, Mandla, Engineering Mandla. So Engineering Mandla, Engineering Mandla, put up your hand. There he is. <coughs> His question was actually following on of what Carl asked without uh, talking about it together. And his question was, why did Jesus deal differently with the sellers of birds in the temple? Uh, as with the others. Well, he didn't deal differently. It may seem so from John's gospel, but he didn't. So go quickly to John chapter 2, just very quickly. John chapter 2. And this was exactly the offerings that had been taking place in the temple. John chapter 2, verse 14. Right, verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to, the, to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple. So he dealt the same with every one of them. He drove them all out uh, with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. And this is the, the verse that gave Amandla some pause. He told those who sold the pigeons, take these away, take these things away, do not make my house, my father's house, a house of trade. Almost as though he was, he was dealing differently with the pigeon sellers. Well, first of all, uh, he, we, we really, really dealt the same with all of them. He, he drove them all out. And it was easier to drive out animals or they would either be in a pen or close somewhere, so open the gate and you would drive them out. But the pigeons would be kept in cages. And so some form of captivity. And so he tells those people, Get out of here with your pigeons and your, and your turtle doves. If you go to Matthew, Luke, Mark, and Luke, we find a similar incident, but later in his ministry, uh, he does the same thing in the temple, and there it's very clear. He drives them all out. So no, he doesn't treat the bird sellers differently for any reason at all. He treats them exactly the same, and just the English translation of John seems to make you think. To our westernized sensitivities that summer, the turtle dove, Breeders were kind of a bit more gentle people. No, they weren't. These were guys selling turtle doves to people who were poor and most likely making a good profit of that. So, Mandla, engineering Mandla, it was nothing different with the way he dealt with those uh, with the bird sellers as with the rest. Okay? Next question, which was a very interesting one. This comes from Viticultural Mandla. We've got two Mandlas. Mandla, are you Viticultural Mandla? You work in the Viticultural industry, don't you? There you go. We know how to separate between one or the other. His question was, how do we align the crucifixion with the Levitical sacrifices? How do we align what happened uh, with the Levitical sacrifices with what happened... Sorry, this, these things always don't work when you want it to work. 
with Jesus on the cross. So there's a very clear correlation. And this is all point of Leviticus. Leviticus uh, is a model, it's a picture of what, of a reality which is realized in Jesus Christ uh, much later. So basically, uh, the, 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 the correlation is a good one. And the word you use was, how do you map it? How do you do a one-to-one -one mapping of what happened there? So let's do a one-to-one -one mapping of what happened with, uh, with the sacrifices and how that now is seen in the crucifixion and the death of Jesus Christ. So there are four elements uh, of the sacrifice offering. Number one, there's the offerer, the Jew, who comes and brings his offering to be offered. Number two, there's the offering or the sacrifice. Number three, there's the priest who performs a priestly function in taking parts of the offering and doing something with that. And number four, there's the recipient. Who is the recipient of all of this? God. Right. So, all those elements, can we see them in the, in the, in the, in the crucifixion, the death of Jesus Christ? And I think, I think we can uh, if we go to a very uh, well-known portion of Scripture, which links up directly with Leviticus, it's Hebrews, go to Hebrews chapter 10. I'll try and get it as quickly as I can. But I think it's good we see the correlation that Leviticus is not a dead book. It's a, very a book that's very much alive, especially as it impacts so much on the gospel in tremendous ways and on the holiness of God and how we live. And we look at how we live next week. But uh, if you go to Hebrews chapter 10 very quickly, uh, and let's see if we can just show from that portion whether this is the case. So, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 9 says this, and listen to the words, and I'll try to tell you who is, who is, the, who is, who is at the center of the focal point in his portions. For since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of the realities, it can, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifice that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Who is that? Those who draw near. Who is that? But he tells us. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshippers have once been cleansed? So this is a, the focus is here on the sacrifice, but it's from the perspective of the worshippers who are not cleansed by the sacrifices they bring day by day and year by year. Uh, because they, they are bringing the sacrifices, but those sacrifices are never, the, the, those sins are never removed permanently. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience of sin. So here, we find that the worshippers are the focal point of the first nine verses of, of Hebrews chapter 10 in relation to the sacrifice. It says, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sins of these worshippers. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. So then Christ quotes uh, the prophecy concerning himself. So now, what about the sacrifice itself? So Christ, we see, is the one who brings the sacrifice. He, brings, he offers his own body. He, he is the offerer of his own body. In fact, that is uh, emphasized in John chapter 10, verse 17. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down of my own accord. I have authority to lay down, lay down and have authority to take it up again. This charge I have from the Father. So Christ, when it comes to the reality, he is the one who is the offerer. He offers himself. He brings himself as the offering for the sacrifice. So if Christ is the offerer, who is or what is the sacrifice? Venture a guess. Lorenzo, who is the sacrifice? What is the sacrifice? If Christ is the offerer, what is the sacrifice? Christ again. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10. You see Hebrews chapter 10. And by that wall, he's speaking by the will of the Father, by that wall, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the offerer. And his body is also the offering. So we know that from Leviticus, there's other parts where components. There's the offerer, there's the offering, and there's a priest who must then take the offering and present it before the Lord. Who is the priest who does this? So in Hebrews, Christ is the priest. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 to 14. 
This is a daily offering officiating priests in the Levit in Levitical order. That's the model. Here's the reality. And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. Who is the focal point here? It's the priest. It's no longer the worshiper. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering is perfected for all time, those are being sanctified. So he's the offerer, he's the offering, and he's also the priest who presents that before the Lord in the priestly function. So the question now is, who then receives this? In the Old Testament, it was clear that Moses did this, and we know that the Lord received it because when it came to the worship offerings, uh, it says that it went as a sweet, aro uh, sweet aroma to the Lord, and he was pleased with that. So who is the recipient of the offering when it comes to Jesus Christ? Not a trick question. Cameron, God. Thank you, Cameron. God the Father is the recipient. And I will just quote this for you. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So your question was very relevant. Uh, you tracked the Levitical uh, um, uh, sacrifice, and that's seen in the sacrifice of Christ in his entirety. Because he, what he did by his sacrifice of himself he answered and uh, accounted for every single aspect of uh, sacrificial offering by being the perfect offerer, by being the perfect sacrifice, by being the perfect priest. And so therefore his offering was accepted and God was pleased to the extent that we no longer have to offer offerings for sin any longer. Any questions before we go on? Or comments? No? Okay, so let's get back into Leviticus. Last week, we, uh, we went briefly through the five offerings, uh, and those were the five offerings we went through. Uh, we, we, we explained how they are grouped into worship offerings and sin offerings. I'm not going to go through that again, uh, but we did work on that last week. We did look at one offering to show how it, uh, how it unpacks with both that which the worshippers had to do and that which the priests had to do. And we ended up kind of looking at what the people do and what the priests do. And we saw that the first uh, six chapters, uh, Levitic Leviticus 1 to chapter 6 verse 7, dealt with all that the offerer had to do in bringing the offering to the priest and that the sacrifice could be done. But we said it has to be read in conjunction with what takes place in chapter 6 verse 8 down to chapter 7 verse 10 because that's what the priest had to do with the same offerings where he was responsible. And that's kind of where we ended last week, if I remember correctly, which was where the questions were asked of that. Now, two points to still remember under this offerings. Number one, these things that people must not do. And so we find, as far as the people are concerned, they must not eat fat. The village chapter seven. And they must not Drink blood. Why must they not eat fat? Sorry? Why must not eat fat? Leviticus 3 verse 16. Right there on the board. Because the fat belonged to God. The fat portion belonged to God. God says, that is mine. You do not eat it. Not ever. And even if you find an animal that, is, that has been killed or has died or has been injured, and you get fat from that animal, you can use it for anything else. You can use it to put on your hair. You can use it to grease the wheels of your wagons. You can use it to do anything with it, but you can't eat it. So the fat belonged to God. That's why uh, they couldn't eat the fat. The blood? Well, the blood they couldn't drink, and we know why that's a reality we get to chapter 17, which speaks about the significance of the shedding of blood. So, the people are prohibited from eating certain things. They can't eat the blood and they can't eat the fat. What about the priest? Well, the priest was told there are things that he must eat. They didn't have a, a choice. It wasn't an option. The priest had to eat uh, the portions from the offerings, from the food offerings, and it was a perpetual um, uh, command to the priestly 
family they had to eat and they did not eat of that, then they would be judged because of not eating. God had come wanting to eat. And in fact, that becomes quite serious later on uh, when we get to the priests themselves. So that kind of finishes uh, the, the, the teaching on the, on the offerings in Leviticus. There's a lot that we haven't spoken about. But these are the high points that need to help you keep a separation in your mind about what happens with the priests, what happens with the people, what happens with the different offerings, what they are for, and how they unpack later on. And all these unpack throughout of Leviticus. We'll see a lot of this later on when we get to chapter 17. Questions? Comments? Nothing? So, at the end of this chapter, there's a summary. And um, here's the offerings that's summarized. Burnt offering, grain offering, sin offering, guilt offering, ordination offering, peace offerings. How many offerings are there? How many offerings are there? Six. Did we deal with six? No. So here we find, here's where the Bible contradicts itself completely, right? We've now got a thing to deal with with the Bible's contradictions. We showed five offerings, here's six. Well, the sixth offering is about to come up. The priesthood. So the sixth offering is seen being played out now when the priests are ordained. It's ordination offering. It's one of the other offerings that is um, used, and they take from the various other offerings to now have an ordination offering. Which was, given, which was told to Moses very clearly that this is the offering that is being, must be formed when the priests and the priesthood, Aaron and his sons, are ordained as priests. A very specific offering, not something that happened every, every day, but was specifically to identify and ordain priests for the priesthood. So the priesthood is covered in, chapter, in chapters 10, 8 down to chapter 10, and it's the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. And the priests that are named in Leviticus, in this priesthood, is Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. Those are Aaron's four sons. We know something happens to two sons, and something happens to the other two sons. And we'll get that shortly. But now the question is, if, if, if Moses is ordaining priests uh, in uh, Leviticus chapter 8, uh, were the priests before this? Were the priests before this? Yes, they were. Not Levitical priests, and not Jewish priests, but they were priests. So priest, the priesthood is nothing new to the children of Israel. Number one, Melchizedek, king of Salem, he was a priest, right? A priest of the Most High God, Genesis 14. Genesis 41, Joseph marries a daughter of a priest in Egypt. So there were priests in Egypt, and so, the, so when, 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 when the Jews heard about priesthood, they knew what priests did and what they were. Exodus chapter, chapter 3, Moses is living in the, in the, in the, in the desert with his father-in-law, Jethro, who is a priest of Midian. Exodus 19, there are already priests among the people of Israel, functioning in a certain priestly way because the Levitical family, the Levitical tribe, the tribe of Levi is functional, but they're not ordained as, the, as Aaron and his sons have been ordained because, you know, in Exodus chapter 19, at Sinai, Moses is still going up to get the law, and the Lord says to him, and let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And so there, were, there was a form of priestly function, but it was not the Aaronic uh, or Levitical function as was ordained in chapter 8 of Leviticus. In fact, in Exodus chapter 24, verse 1 to 8, it can always be argued that Moses fills the role of a priest or priestly role as he works uh, through the things God is commanding command to do with, with Aaron. So, we have the Levitical priesthood, we have the ordination of the priests, we have the inauguration of the priests, and we have the condemnation of the priests in chapters 8, and 9, and 10. Ordina ordination, inauguration, Condemnation. Three things happening with the priests from chapters 8, 9, and 10. Chapter 8. The priests are ordained not according to human design. Because after everything that is said in the chapter, and after everything that Moses does for the priest, it says, as the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses. So this was clearly 
The office of the priesthood was not only uh, uh, um, explained to Moses, but the Lord ensured that it was his design that was followed and his commands were followed. So this was not according to any human design. This was according to what God intended the priest to be because they would be his representative to the people and they would represent the people before God. So the pivotal role they played was essential that every single facet of what they did and what they were was according to what God commanded. Number two, nothing was done in secret. When they were ordained, Moses called the entire nation of Israel. Now understand, they, this is a huge company of people. We have already explained how approximately two million people left Egypt. These are all in the desert right now. So Moses calls the entire company around the opening of the tent, and he ordains the priest in the sight of the people. Nothing secret about this. There's no secret priesthood that happens, works in shadows and mysticism. This was open. It was transparent. Everyone could see who the priests were and were being ordained. In fact, um, they would then be, would have acknowledged that these men are worthy of, of being priests. And thirdly, it wasn't a rushed process. This was a seven-day process. And so everything that the Lord did about ordaining the priest was, was commanded, was designed. It was, it, was, it was set out in a specific way. And the priest had to do this. Once Moses had, uh, had performed the sacrifice to ordain them, Mo Aaron and his sons had to sit in the door of the tent for seven days, eating all the sacrifices that were, were going to be made because of the priest. Why did they do that? Because God told them to. That's the answer. In fact, when you ask, when the Jews were asked the question, why don't you eat fat? Or why don't you um, eat our unclean animals? There's only one answer. Because God is holy. He told us to do it. So the priests do exactly as, as Moses has been told by God, and God commands Moses, ordain the priests after this fashion, and make sure that they follow everything to the record. Then the priests are inaugurated. And we see something happens in the inauguration of the priests, chapter 9. First of all, there's a transition of leadership. You'll find that it says in, um, before this, Moses, Moses did. Moses did as the Lord commanded. Moses did as the Lord commanded. Moses did as the Lord commanded. When we get to chapter 9, it's a slight shift. And it shows, and it's, we start seeing that Moses said what Aaron should do. Moses said what Aaron should do. And then eventually, we get to the end of chapter 9, we see everything that Aaron did. And it's a shift in leadership as far as the priestly office is concerned, because Aaron and his sons are now the ordained priests, and they function in that role so much so that Moses no longer has to have a priestly function, which he had up until the point of the inauguration. And then third, and then also on the same point, There was a divine confirmation of that inauguration. How did God show that he approved of the inauguration, ordination, or inauguration of the Aaronic priesthood? What did God do? He does this twice in this book. In this case, fire comes up from before the Lord, And it devours the sacrifice. Think of this very quickly. The sacrifice is on the altar, the brazen altar outside the tent. Where is God at that point in time, as far as they are concerned in, in relation to the Israelites? Where is God at that point in time? Where? Where inside? Holy of Holies. He's in the Holy of Holies. That's where, the, that's where he dwells, between the, the, between the cherubim and the mercy seat. That speaks about God's um, uh, presence. Cloud by day, fire by night. But that's where God is. That's why they can't come into the Holy of Holies. There's a curtain between that and the, and the tent of meeting. There's a curtain at the door of the tent of meeting, off to the side. And the fire goes from God and consumes the offering and destroys nothing in its path. That's a miracle beyond understanding. That's a miracle beyond understanding. He consumes the, the sacrifice. And that fire comes out, it says, comes forth from the Lord, right to the tabernacle. As some people say, came down from heaven. Well, that's not what the language is telling us. This is a miracle that it, it was so overwhelming that it astounded them. So we find the priests are ordained, the priests are um, inaugurated, and then we find the priests were all condemned. 
And this is a sad, sad part in the, in the process of, 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 of ordaining the priest. We're very soon, I'm not sure exactly whether it's immediately after our close is to the actual ordination, but chapter 10 speaks about um, two men who should have known better. Know the names? Yeah, what are they? Sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. And they came before the Lord with strange fire. We don't know what the strange fire is. We're not told what the strange fire is. There are two things that some Bible expositors put forward as possibly that um, led to them offering strange fire without defining the strange fire. One of them can be um, seen. I'm sitting in Hebrews. I couldn't figure out why this looks so strange. <laughs> we go back to Leviticus chapter 10. One of the things that is mentioned right here is quite significant. Where God, and it says, and now Nadab and Abihu, chapter 10 of Leviticus, the sons of Aaron each took his sense and put a fire in it and laid the incense on it and offered unauthorized fire for the Lord, which is not commanded. Now down to verse 8, where God has dealt with his men. And how does he deal with them? Fire comes out from the Lord again. For the first time, God consumed the sacrifice. Now the same fire of the Lord consumes these disobedient priests. And they were doing something within the tent of meeting uh, that caused the Lord to judge them. And what they were doing was attached to their offering of strange fire. And in verse 8 of chapter 10, it says, And the Lord spoke to Aaron. The Lord is now speaking to Aaron directly, but he is now the priest, the high priest. Drink no wine or strong drink. You or your sons with you that when you go into the tent of meeting. And some exposers have posited that these men may have been intoxicated when they did what they did. Hence the warning here, before the next sons and Aaron have a right to go into the tent of meeting. So there could be something about that. We're not sure, but certainly it seems to tie in with that. And they're told they must have no strong drink and no wine when they worship uh, before the Lord. Now, wine was a, a common beverage for the people of Israel, but when it came to the priesthood, there was prohibitions that they had to follow, especially when it came to uh, serving in the temple or rather in the tabernacle at this point in time. Any questions on the and the bio? Right. That chapter ends with another bit of a slip up. So Nadab and Abihu are consumed and God puts two other men to replace them. And they are Eliezer and Ithamar, the other, the two younger sons of Aaron. They now become the priests. And um, these men are significant. Uh, later on, in, as we get into numbers, you'll see how significant these men are and how their progeny behaved in a very godly way. And God identified them as significant uh, priests in the, in the priesthood. But we find, as we come to the end of this chapter, we find that Nadab and Abihu were killed in front of Aaron. Aaron is standing there, and the fire comes and consumes them. His sons have been consumed by God. And Moses says to him, don't mourn. You don't loosen, you don't tear your robes, you don't loosen your hair, you don't mourn. You act as though nothing has ever happened. And they go into placing the other two sons in that service. We find that the sacrifice is made. And one of the things that the sacrifice required was that the priests eat the meat of the sacrifice, which was a portion. And these men don't. These men are fearful. In fact, the whole end of chapter 10 shows, speaks about them being kind of on tenterhooks. And so they don't do everything. And, and, and Aaron himself um, is still mourning. And Moses challenges them. Moses rebukes them. And Aaron says to Moses, what's happened is not right. But consider what has gone before. In fact, this is Aaron's, Aaron's work. Aaron says to Moses, Behold, today they've offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. They've done the right thing. And yet such things as these have happened to me, the death of his sons. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would the Lord have approved? And when Moses heard that, he approved. So this chapter ends where the priests are not doing anything sinful, but they fail to follow God's commands to the letter. And they again have to learn 
that if that is done, Moses is called upon to rebuke him. At this point, because it wasn't serious enough for death, they are rebuked. And Aaron, here shows a very unique feature. He stands up to Moses for the first time. He actually stands up to Moses. Aaron has come into his place as the high priest. He comes into the place to defend the actions of his son. As wrong as they were, they were not worthy of death. And so Aaron, we see at the end of chapter 10, the end of the section on the priesthood, Aaron is now established as the high priest, and his two sons, uh, Eleazar and Ithamar, are the priests who serve under him. Any questions on that? Please, yes, please yes, do. So. You're late now? So, <laughs> hold for me. Um, in chapter 8, yeah. uh, actually chapter 7, <clears throat> it says in verse 1, And the Lord spoke, and Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. From this point on, this is not me reading, this is, God. <laughs> this is me saying. Uh, from this point on, there's commandments about the fire. And so what, sorry? There's commandments about the fire. Yes. The end of verse, um, uh, did I say verse 1? I meant verse 8. But at the end of verse 9, it says, The fire and the altar shall be kept burning on it. And then verse 12, The fire and the altar shall be kept burning on it. And so on. You can read for yourself. But the, the ongoing command there is to keep the fire burning. Yes. At the end of chapter 9, it says that there was a fire that comes out from God, yes. um, indicating there's divine fire, and yes. this must be kept going. It yes. should not ever go out. Mm. The way that they should keep it alive is by bringing wood to yes. keep it going. Yes. Then in chapter 10, it says, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took a, his censer and put fire in it. Yes. The suggestion is they failed. The mm. fire went out. Ah. So they brought fire to the altar, which they were not allowed to do. The, the command is, don't let it go out. The failure was, they let it go out, so they had to restart the fire. So even though they were trying to do the right thing, they didn't follow God's command, and that's why the judgment was so severe. Excellent point. <coughs> Did not know that. I've just learned something from the pulpit. Great stuff. So the whole point of this book, you can see it's, it proliferates. What God said, God commanded. What God said, God commanded. And there was no latitude for deviation. So here were men, as Denver's just account now, did try to do the right thing in the wrong way, and God destroyed them. What happens later on in David's day? When they bring the ark home? Huh? Same thing. They put the ark on the cart, which was wrong. They were doing the right thing, taking it back to, to where it should be, but on the cart, which was wrong. And then the cart wobbles. And the ark moves, and two men put their hands out to say that they were doing the right thing, to stop them falling, right? And God strikes them dead. So just doing the right thing because it seems right. Uh, the Old Testament is clear. Be very careful. You've got to do the right thing for the right reason. If you do the right thing the wrong way, there are consequences. And these we can unpack later on into our lives here and now. The next portion, I'm not going to spend on too much time, and I'll tell you why. But it does cover... The unclean, the clean, unclean um, commands. And so we see the uh, in chapter 11 is animals, chapter 12 is childbirth, chapter 13 is leprosy, chapter 14 is leprous persons, and chapter 15 is body discharge. Now, there's a lot about this, and, I, and I do, for the sake of time, I'm not going to move on from here, but I just want to point out maybe one or two things that takes place here that may be uh, interesting. The animals that uh, they were told they could eat and could not eat were clearly defined. It was defined around the hooves and the chewing of the cud. But there were also exceptions. And so there were both the standards and the exception. And these Jews would be eating according to what God told them about the animal. And so there certain animals they could eat and certain animals they couldn't eat. And so as they lived amongst the pagan nations, they would be asked what? Yes, some lovely pork. Yes, some roast rabbit. Yes, some crayfish. No, they wouldn't be crayfish. And they would say no. Why? Why would they not take those food? They were unclean, yeah. But what did they say to the people who were giving to them? What was the reason they did not eat? The answer is very simple. 
Let's say because God spoke. God said. My God said, I can't eat this. My God is holy. He's called me to be holy. And I need to do as he commands. It's because God said so. And we're very often scared of saying that today. Why do you believe what you believe? Well, let's find a scientific answer. Let's find a logical response. Let's see the rationale. No, the Bible says. The Bible says, and this is why I believe it. We are a people of faith. They here were learning to become a people of faith. They needed to learn that, and they were not there yet. But God said, that's why we do it. Then on childbirth, I'll go this as quick as I can. Uh, so that because God said, childbirth, again, the patriarchy, eh? Ah, uh, this patriarchy of the Old Testament. If a woman gave birth to a child, she was unclean for seven days. On the eighth day, the child, if it was a boy child, on the eighth day, he'd be circumcised, and then she'd be unclean for another 33 days. If she gave birth to a girl, she was unclean for, for 14 days, or two weeks, and then unclean for another 66 days. Why is God so unjust to the women and not to the men? So that's, uh, what's that? That's because God said, there is something here that is, is significant. What happens to a boy child on the eighth day? Can they break that law? Can they break that law? Not if they want to be obedient about God or Abraham. Every male child will be circumcised. And so God makes allowance for that, uh, in that that is shortened. That's one of the things that is significant. But God simply said, for a boy, you only are unclean seven days, then he's handed over for circumcision, and then you carry on with your, with your cleansing process. This wasn't a sin, right? Is childbirth a sin? No, this was not sins. These were things that happened to people as they went through life. Um, you may touch a dead animal by mistake, uh, which comes down later on to uh, leprous persons. And then, of course, we find, we go through all of those. Uh, there were ways of actually, uh, after she was cleansed, or after she was finished the time of cleansing, she had to offer a sacrifice. This was one of the, it's only two places where a woman's able to present an offering to the priest for her. This is the first one. I'll share the second one very shortly. Leprosy. Who's the doctors here? Are there any doctors here? Who are the doctors here? Put your hands up. What is Hansen's disease? Come on, doctors. Hansen's disease is the leprosy that we understand today. Where your nose falls off. It's actually a, a, a neurodegenerative disease where your fingers fall off. The leprosy that we have in our mind that's the leprosy that we think about. The leprosy in the Old Testament covered possibly that, but everything else was a skin disease. It could be a, a mark, a scratch, anything would be classed as leprosy. Any skin defilement would be classed as leprosy. And there were laws for diagnosing those infections. And who were the ones who were commanded to diagnose the condition and when it was over? The priests. So they, the priests were given that. They would identify when the person was clean or unclean and then perform the various um, uh, cleansing for that. Then we have the same thing on leprous persons and it talks about the laws for cleansing, cleansing those who are healed and again laws for cleansing a house in the same area. So even the house could be leprous. This was mildew, algae, whatever grows on your walls. Uh, and there was serious consequences that was there and there was ways to deal with it. So that chapter deals with that, and finally, it deals with bodily discharges. And here is one where you'll find, this is for both men and women, and one of the things that's covered by this is a woman's monthly period, and when she was cleansed of that, she would also offer an offering, because it's only two, only two occasions where a woman could bring an offering to the priest, and for her on, her, on her own behalf. Every other offering is offered by men to the priest who would sacrifice those things. Questions? Please, yes. Please do, please. Uh, thank you for having you in the... The question is that the animals are they unclean? If, um, are they unclean or are they not unclean? Um, there's a difference between every other chapter the Lord says, even in childbirthing, uh, that the woman is unclean uh, the leprous man is unclean. But with the animals, he says, it is unclean to you. 
the animal is not unclean just to the nation of Israel because the other pagan nations could eat it with no problem. God didn't judge them for eating it. Correct. But part of God's separation of Israel as a nation to himself mm. was an eating habit or appetite that would be unique, di different from the pagan nations. Yes. So God doesn't have a problem with us eating. There's ostrich in there. I don't know if you yes. notice. Yes. Says, These birds you will not eat. So I, I mean, I would be breaking the law because I love ostrich. <laughs> But it doesn't apply to us because we're no. not Jews. Correct. It's it's unclean to the Jews, but it's not unclean uh, to to um, pagans or at least Gentiles. Um, secondly, uh, in the New Testament, in Acts, God actually does away with Correct. the separation Peter. of these uh, animals. But interestingly, the laws regarding uncleanness with regards to childbirth and everything else that's not rescinded. Yeah. Uh, because it's still. It's not in the sense that it is dirty. It's just that God views uh, the uncleanness of the body to be something that needs to be cleansed from. Correct. So there's, there's things that they need to do so in, in order to be cleansed from that. Yeah. So, and it's a good point that Dem has picked up on. And just remember, when you read through the Old Testament like this, every word counts. Every little twist of a word, inclusion, exclusion counts significantly. Especially since this is a culture and a, and, and, and a, a customs so far removed from us. Uh, is, we'll see something just now, very quickly, I'll get there, where they use words which we have got no idea what it means. Uh, we have schismized it, we've got no idea what it means. And so we find, we've come now to chapter 16, I'm going to end at chapter 16, um, as much time as I have, but five minutes. In the chapter 16, this is the Day of Atonement. This is, the, this is a, like the major, one of the major... If you look at Leviticus, it, it builds up from chapter 1 and in chapter 16 and chapter 70, kind of almost in the middle, uh, are, are quite significant points. And then from there, it goes on to how to live in the light of what has gone before. So, so you have all of that taking place in Leviticus. And chapter 16 is one of those pivotal points because of the significance of that day. The Day of Atonement only happened once a year. It happened once a year. It happened in a very specific way. And it happened... Uh, for a very specific reason. Number one, all the, all the sacrifices that we've spoken up until now, uh, the sin offering, the guilt offering, and all those offerings, not the, I'm about the sin offerings, were for sins that were unintentional. They were not, not premeditated sins. What happened when a person premeditated something and did it? A man decided, I'm going to murder someone. What happened to him? He was killed. A man decided, I'm going to take someone's wife. What happened to him? He was killed. So premeditated sins were dealt with very quickly when they were discovered. They were always discovered. Some things could be done in a way which was discovered. But the sacrifices were inadvertent sins, sins that were, in, were not intentional. It happened, and you realize you were now committed the sin, so you went for the sacrifice to be cleansed of that particular sin for that particular day. And going home, you may commit the same sin again. And so there was a continual sacrifice of sins. But when it came to the Day of Atonement, this was a single sin for one day in the year. And this Day of Atonement sacrifice system, this model, the system, had a single function. It was a reset button. It dealt with the sins that were not covered by, by, the, by the guilt and sin offering, but also for sins that were intentional and it's covered and they haven't been judged gets judged on the Day of Atonement. That's why it's a significant day. What happens on that day is significant, not only what happened to the Jews, but in what it speaks about of Christ when he atones for us. So this was a reset button, and so they reset the button, they start all over again. And for 40 years in the desert, they did this every single year. Never ever being fully redeemed from their sin, never ever being fully cleansed, and always having the prospect of sinning tomorrow again, and having to be uh, cleansed again. So, very quickly, who are the role players in this? There are two role players. It is uh, Aaron as the high priest. He's the only one who functions in the, on the Day of Atonement. The other priests are with the rest of the, of, of the nation. It's only Aaron who functions in a very specific way, dressed in a very specific way, with a very elaborate uh, uh, clothing, uh, doing, doing some very specific things. And Aaron, the high priest, is the one role player. He's the major role player. And the other is the rest of the nation. Number two, what are the sacrifices? Well, there's one uh, for Aaron and his family. 
Aaron's going to sacrifice a bull for himself and his family as a sin offering to atone for his house as the high priest and for his family. So before he goes into the, temp into the tabernacle and into the holiest of all, on behalf of the people of Israel, he's going to atone for his own sins because he was a sinful man. So he had to atone for his sins with a sin offering. And then he has another uh, offering, the ram, which comes later on as a burnt offering. And then there was an offering for the people. They brought two goats, a sin offering, and a scapegoat. And they also brought the ram for a burnt offering. And so the scapegoat is a thing that we always kind of uh, uh, hang around. What is the story about the scapegoat? So Aaron offers the bull for himself. He cleanses himself, and he cleanses uh, his family, and he's now ready to be able to offer on behalf of the people. And they bring him two goats. The first goat, chosen by Lot, is killed and atoned for the people, the holy of holies, the tent, and the altar. Understand this. The tabernacle was the dwelling place of God at that time. The Holy of Holies is where he was, between the cherubim on the mercy seat, which was the mercy seat speaks about atonement. That's what it means. And yet Aaron had to, he had to atone for the people, the tent, uh, the Holy of Holies, and the altar. Because this picture that we have here is that when sin is amongst people, it contaminates everything. Everything that they touch is contaminated. Remember, how does the Holy of Holies get contaminated? It only goes in once a year, right? He goes in clean. How does the Holy of Holies get contaminated? And it must be because it tells you he has to, he has to, he has to cleanse it. What happened when the cloud lifted and moved? What did the Israelites do? They? They packed up. What did they pack up? Who packed it up? The Levites. So they take down the, the, the surrounding walls, they take down the, the, the gate, they take down the altar and the labor, and they take down the tent. What's in, what's in the back? The holies of all. What's in the holies of all? The ark. They could have touched that. They could have touched that and pack it up and move to the next place. So at that point in time, God removes his presence from judgment on them, and they pack up everything. And the Levites have to carry the ark in a very specific place, not on the court, with, with stays through the rings, and they have to carry it. The tents folded in a certain way, everything's packed up. So men have been touching the holiest of all, the holy of holies, as they pack up the tent and erect it again. So there's been contamination. And so when it comes to the day of atonement, the sacrifice of this first goat cleanses everything. Everything is reset to day one as though they were totally clean. The second goat is kept alive, and the second goat uh, is a representation of the people of the nation. What Aaron does is Aaron lays both his hands on the head of the goat and he confesses over the goat the iniquities of the people. Now, that's everything they've done for that year. Everything gets laid on the whole head of this one goat. And the goat is loosed into the wilderness and is sent to Azazel. Who, what, who is Azazel? It's in the Bible, so it's got to be something, right? Where's Hilton? Oh, he's hiding in the passage. Sorry, Hilton, um, you can't talk from there. What is Azazel? Who is Azazel? Where is Azazel? It's one of the things we can't tell you much about. They understood what it was. So for the people in the wilderness, when Moses says, we send the goat to Azazel or Azazel, we not we try to frame that. It, it really, as far as we can tell from translation, it means the scapegoat. Uh, some of the goat is getting... This goat is a scapegoat, and it's going to a desert. So whether the scapegoat is the Azazel or it's going to a place of Azazel, we don't know. There's some things we are not told. The mysteries of God sometimes remain secret because he keeps them secret. The point of this is, this is significant. What has taken place is the sins of the entire nation is put on the head of a goat. The goat doesn't die. The goat runs away. It's taken by a man into the wilderness and set free. And the sins that the people had being guilty of for a year is removed from them completely for that cycle. And this is a, is a, is a picture of uh, the, the, the atoning work of Christ as he takes on our sin on, he, on, on him. And when he saves us, our sin is removed completely. So what happened here in a, as a model year by year happens with us completely when Christ comes, when Christ saves us from our sin. And then the final thing is, um, I'm not worried about the location that much. It was the Holy of Holies. 
and uh, it was once a year. Quickly, and I'm going to finish this very quickly, uh, the David Tillman uh, compared to the other sacrifices. David Tillman, other sacrifices. David Tillman was once a year, other sacrifices daily. David Tillman, the high priest, only performed the function, and the others, Aaron's sons, performed the function. David Tillman took place in the Holy of Holies, or the other uh, sacrifices took place on the brazen altar. David Tillman was a national forgiveness of sin, a national atonement for iniquities. Uh, every other day, it was personal atonement for iniquities. David Tillman, for all the sins, including intentional sins, are reset and they start all over again. As far as the other sacrifice are concerned, it's for unintentional sins only. And that brings us to the end of the Day of Atonement. That's next week. Any questions? We've got a question for, for example, one question. Only one question. If you have any more questions, give them to me and I'll try and answer them next week. Hands, hands. Going once, going twice. Okay, have a break. We only have a minute or two. Uh, please take...